Don't you hate it when you write a work of fiction and then a billionaire supervillain shows up telling you that everything was real? Every time, man. Genres don't die in Hollywood, they just take naps. Once upon a time, the cowboy movie was the superhero movie of its day, and then musicals were all the rage. Then the western faded, and the musical made a quiet exit. And yet, decades later, there's a musical and a western in contention for best picture smack dab in the middle of the superhero era. Now, Sandra Bullock and Channing Tatum are trying to bring back the romantic adventure comedy with The Lost City, updating it and paying tribute all along the way. The premise is rather familiar. In fact, strikingly familiar, but we'll get into that. At its core, a romance novelist is suddenly thrust into the middle of an adventure resembling her steamy stories. This time, her last, best hope is the man who appears on the cover of her books. It would seem weird to have a cover model for books that use paintings instead of pictures be more famous than the author. That is, if the real world did not contain the one name wonder known as Fabio. Well, the square-jawed cross of Michael Bolton and an American gladiator does have a last name. It's Lanzoni. But when your first name is Fabio, who needs a last name? Fabio, for those who missed his 15 minutes of fame, is a real-world model, best known for posing for the covers of the genre of romance novel known as bodice rippers, period romance novels with romantic scenes that tend to have the hero treating the heroine's clothes like wrapping paper on Christmas morning. Fabio is known for only buttoning about a third of his shirt up and, of course, for his luxurious long hair. For a time, at least, Fabio became better known than the authors of the books he appeared on and would do appearance tours for women who wouldn't mind a little consensual bodice ripping. This was the look and dynamic behind Channing Tatum's character of Alan, who was the book character Dash come to life, the hero of author Loretta Sage's novels. Fabio was of course the obvious influence for the Allen's book character come to life Dash, but the actor Channing Tatum had a different influence for his portrayal of the model, who might have a little more going on than it seems at first. It turns out that the influence wasn't pretty close. Co-star Brad Pitt. Specifically, the Brad Pitt of the 1994 movie about a father and his sons, Legends of the Fall. The one that's about Montana and the transition from the west of the 1800s to the realities of the 20th century, like a world war and prohibition. The one with the fishing is a river runs through it. Brad Pitt had a bit of a career playing the troubled brother son of rural sage-like families in the early 90s. For Legends of the Fall, that featured a Brad Pitt with, of course, luscious long hair that was a little wilder and more untamed than his long hair look in Interview with the Vampire, let's say. Also, side note, man, I miss my beautiful long blonde hair. Mm, curse you genetics. Anyway, Tatum and Pitt have some off time riding motorcycles together, which is really unfair to any other motorcyclist at the watering hole when you, you know, gotta compete with Brad Pitt and Channing Tatum riding up on motorcycles. If Keanu joins them, whew, might as well turn your motorcycle in for a minivan. Tatum has nothing but good things to say about his co-star, saying that he's everything you'd want him to be. He's everything you want him to be. One of the things that make media moguls such great villains in movies is that they make such great villains in real life. Absolutely. Using them as templates for your power-hungry consequences are for little people types dates back to the early days of films. A movie designed to take an unsubtle dig at media mogul William Randolph Hearst, Citizen Kane is regarded as one of the best movies ever made and certainly influential. And not just for using real world media moguls as a template for your villain. William Randolph Hearst, Ted Turner and Rupert Murdoch have all taken their turn as the bad guys in movies like the Bond movie Tomorrow Never Dies. Caesar had his legions, Napoleon had his armies. I have my divisions. TV, news, magazines. This time, it's the Murdochs and their media empire that gets a bit of a send up, but it's not Rupert at the top. Instead, it's the overlooked Asan who didn't get handed the empire and instead has embarked on a crazy global search for things that no one else can have. You know, rich guy stuff. Exactly. Okay, gather round, let me tell you a story. It's about a romance novelist who's suffering from a bit of a burnout and she gets a hold of a clue that could lead to a particular treasure that forces her into the kind of adventure she normally writes about. During the course of the adventure, she meets a mismatched hero and romantic interest who she bickers with during the peril, including losing a vehicle down a steep slope until they find out they don't hate each other, they love each other, and together they defeat the bad guy who's been using them to find his treasure. 
That, by the way, is not Lost City. That's the Michael Douglas Kathleen Turner vehicle romancing the stone, the clearest inspiration for Lost City. The character of actual action hero Jack Trainer is even a bit of a nod as Douglas's exotic bird smuggler turned hero was named Jack, and the actor playing Turner's sister, her last name was Trainer. Jack Trainer, huh? Hey? All right, that's a bit of a stretch, but that's off to you, IMDb poster. They don't credit the trivia entries. If you're going to use any model to bring back the romantic action movie, Romancing the Stone, yeah, that's a good choice. The movie was successful enough to merit a sequel, Jewel of the Nile, and almost a TV series on NBC before that was sidelined. Cynics will tell you that it's a superhero and existing IP world and we're just living in it. Time was a studio that would make a big but relatively safe bet on a big budget, big box office movie to cover not only regular operating costs, but also losses from smaller and riskier movies. These movies were called tentpole films as they were the tentpole holding up the ceiling of the studio. But then, someone got the idea that you could just make a bunch of tentpole movies if you have enough already established properties. Things like the Marvel Comics catalog, or Star Wars, or even DC Comics, who, despite struggles with critics, continue to power on, demonstrating the power of the existing IP tentpole movie. In that environment, budgets at the top have ballooned, and they've taken it from the middle budget movies in the 40 to 50 million dollar range. That means that, essentially, it's 100 million plus franchise films and small films under 10 million. I saw that. That 40 to 50 million range was the sweet spot for the romantic comedy adventure that made Sandra Bullock a star. This meant that getting the studio to fork over the 74 million to make a movie without a comp or a comparable film to demonstrate success from this century? A hard task. Bullock empathized with the studio's position, but had more than a little experience in the genre, and told the New York Times in an interview that she also had to know when to start yelling and screaming, something she said that she did twice to get the movie made. The last couple years have been rough, and for a moment there it seemed like the movie theaters themselves might become a thing of the past. But as we slowly work our way back to what we are going to call normal to keep us from curling up in a corner and vibrating gently, we are starting to get the movies that had to be made under strict conditions that included isolating cast and crew and creating an on-set position called the COVID compliance officer who spends their day telling people that the nose has to be covered too and if people stand too close to each other, Tom Cruise will come by and yell at you. In true receive lemons make lemonade fashion, Bullock and Tatum made the most of their filming in the Dominican Republic by bringing their children. While their respective parents were away filming, the kids got to enjoy a COVID-safe vacation in the Dominican Republic, far and away from angry Tom Cruises. The two stars' children enjoyed a lengthy play date, complete with dirt bikes because, of course, Bullock remarked that it was the reason for making the movie, but she had been championing the movie for years. There are easier ways to book a vacation, but not one where you also get paid a million dollars. Living the dream. First days at work are always hard. You don't know everyone yet. You haven't gotten into the rhythm of things yet. People put you on a naval ship and throw you in the ocean. The Lost City production was racing the weather and had to get all of their exterior shots done first as quickly as possible, which meant that Daniel Radcliffe's first day was his last moments in the movie. The entire sequence was incredibly elaborate, with a dozen boats in the water filming the two ones on screen, and the mastermind Radcliffe first on board, then tossed in the ocean, then left in a cave by himself for five hours while people in boats filmed him. Production had forgotten to accommodate for the call of nature for Radcliffe, who used the corner of the cave, which Bullock joked was the name of his next book. While Sandra Bullock had been championing the film for a while, most of the rest of the casting had to wait until the cameras were already ready to roll. As is usually the case, you don't always get first choice even when they're down for it. The first actor that was being entertained for the role of Alan Dash, you know, saying Alan Dash, yeah, that sounds like a specific way to duck out on a bill in a restaurant. Oh yeah, we gave him the old Alan Dash, yeah, no? Where the heck was I? Oh yeah, casting. The first choice for Alan was, who else? Ryan Reynolds. Don't panic. It turns out Reynolds was cursed at a young age, and now if he's not in a half dozen movies a year, he'll lose an ab muscle. 
it would have reunited Reynolds and Bullock after their 2009 romantic comedy, The Proposal. Reynolds eventually backed out, probably due to a full card including Free Guy, The Adam Project, Red Notice, The Hitman's Wife's Bodyguard, as well as preparing for Deadpool 3, which is with his own Maximum Effort production company. That's the name, Maximum Effort. It uh, might be their philosophy as well, who knows? Ever since Quentin Tarantino started composing love notes to the B and Grindhouse movies of his youth, meta stories have become more and more prominent. Now, it wasn't just the conversation with the characters and their narrative, but also with the genre and its conventions. Whether it embraces them or subverts them, The Lost City, being about a romance novelist, engaged with romance novel tropes. Sloane and Alan take turns needing rescue, a staple of these kinds of adventures. They also play on the mismatched couple who are forced to spend time together and discover their love. They even present a bit of a love triangle when actual action hero Jack Trainer shows up. Romance is not the only genre being tapped in The Lost City. There's also a return to the early 20th century concept of the adventuring archaeologist that was the basis for characters like Indiana Jones and Lara Croft. Aside from adjusting the colonial concept of removing artifacts from their cultures to be collected elsewhere, there was a little fun hat at some of the sillier tropes of the genre, like the temple full of snakes. To demonstrate Loretta's difficulty writing a new book, she winds up interrogating the idea of a lost civilization's temple being protected by a giant pile of snakes, including the logistics of how they eat and who put them there and why they don't kill henchmen. Previous action anthropologists have had their issues with temple snakes. Sometimes it pays to have the right fans, like the producers, directors, and star of a major motion picture being such big fans of you that they write a character just for you. And to prove it, they just give the character your name. That was the case for Oscar Nunez, best known for his role on The Office as, um, Oscar. That's not a pattern. He has over 80 other roles and none of them are named Oscar. One of those credits includes The Proposal, which was the last time that Bullock and Ryan Reynolds starred together. Oscar's character acted like a bit of a deus ex machina in the film. The solution that just sort of presents itself. He gives Beth the ride on the last leg of her journey when she gets stranded and saves the day two other times. Deus Ex Machina is God in the Machine, a nod to early Greek plays where the gods would literally come down and resolve the drama. The Lost City doesn't really bank that heavily on subtlety, including spelling out some of the jokes for those who had not caught on yet. One of those broad joke lies in the name of Sage's latest book, The Lost City of D. We um, can't tell you what the double entendre is in that title, but we're also pretty sure that you can pick it up. If not, then Bo and Yang's character will literally spell it out for you during the opening of the book tour. I personally signed up to do The Lost City of D. Yeah. And then when they lost it, I was upset, personally. Yeah. It's like... I mean, it's not gone. It's in the movie. When the film was originally announced, it shared the full title with the book in the movie. The decision was made to leave that to the adult parody version or some other reason, but I like to think that one's it. There has been no figure more entertaining and confounding in recent times quite like Florida Man. If we are being fair, if you put any state and man in a search, you'll probably turn up something nutty, but Florida just seems to have a flair for the unique. Every supervillain needs a proper supervillain ride, and Daniel Radcliffe's character had a doozy. A 6x6 six six apocalypse hellfire built from the bones of a Jeep Gladiator. It adds custom material, a Kevlar coating, bulletproof windows, and of course, a sixth axle. Production borrowed the six-wheeled monument for their bad guy ride from Apocalypse and returned it to the company's owner after filming was complete. The journey from the Dominican Republic to Florida went smoothly. It was when the company owner parked the beast in his front yard that there was a problem. At three in the morning, the truck was stolen. The thieves' problem is that the uh, Hellfire isn't exactly a blend-in kind of truck, and so it was spotted and reported from its hiding place relatively quickly. All things considered, a mild day for Florida Man. There's no underestimating the power of the person who does your hair. If you're one of those people who got to keep their hair after high school, that is. Fans of Kevin Smith might remember the Lofty Heights Barbara Streisand's hairdresser was able to achieve, where he could push for his depiction of a giant spider, nature's most efficient hunter. If you don't know, look up his Superman Lives story. A hairdresser was key to some key casting for The Lost City. It happened to be a hairdresser that Brad Pitt and Sandra Bullock shared. 
Who? Upon finding this out, star and producer Bullock asked her hairdresser to float the idea of Pitt appearing in her movie. A deal was struck, and the two agreed to mutual cameos as Pitt was working on Bullet Train at the time, which Bullock agreed to appear in as part of the exchange. Up until the day before, the director brothers, Aaron and Adam Nee, refused to believe that Pitt would show up in their movie. Keeping with the tradition they started with Radcliffe, Pitt's first scene was to run from two exploding cars, something they only got one shot at. Are we done? Clearly the next step in this genre nostalgia is an expendable style super band cast of romantic comedy leads. Meg Ryan, Melanie Griffith, Julia Roberts, Kate Hudson and her mom Goldie Hawn. Get Cameron Diaz in there. Yeah, if you don't know, they're all part of a post-romance support group helping deal with the not so happily ever after.